So let's go back to your um, your uh, postgraduate days. So you're at Berkeley with John Searle, who um, I read his book Mind, Lo Language, and Body recently, which was very interesting. Um, but let's talk about, he had a famous thought experiment for a lot of people who are kind of the layman as the Chinese room. Um, and let's just, I guess you can maybe set it up and we can talk more about it. But basically it was a thought experiment that talked about how computers, um, in today's day and age, people were thinking that it's, uh, we're on the, on the developmental stage of a intelligent AI right. and, and stuff. And so like, let's just, I guess, maybe you can describe the, <laughs> right. the thought experiment. So Searle is very skeptical. He's one of the most famous skeptics about um, AI having consciousness, AI having real understanding of language. Mm -hmm. um, so, and yeah, his most famous argument for this is what's sometimes called, well, he, what he called the Chinese room. Yeah. Right. So the idea is John Searle himself is sitting in this room. Yep. And in one side of the room, uh, Chinese characters come in, mm -hmm. right? And he knows nothing of Chinese. Yeah, he typical says, Western. He looks at these queer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> I mean, I know a little Chinese. Uh, yeah, yeah, I barely. <laughs> <laughs> so he looks at these characters. To him, they basically mean squiggle squaggle. Yep. Right. And then he's got this long, complicated book. And I think this is a little bit of a weakness in the experiment that he doesn't really. Okay. Fair. Thoroughly conceptualize what this book would have to involve, right? But the way he lays it out, he's got this big book that he can look in that says, okay, if I get squiggle squaggle as this input, these, these characters that look like this, then he looks it up in some tra tables in the book, and then he puts some other characters out the other side. Mm -hmm. And, and out, if the rule book is good enough, uh, then it could implement any computer program. Right. right, because computer programs ultimately come down to if-then statements. Yep. If you get this input and you're in this state, then do that. Mm -hmm. Right. So this can all be included in a rule book. So you could implement basically any program in a large enough rule book. So from the outside, it could look like it's Chinese going on. Yeah. Right. So John Searle knows Chinese. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, or, right. or, yeah, yeah, he knows Chinese. <laughs> yeah. Right, so and Cyril says, well, look, I don't know Chinese, Yeah. right? It's absurd to think that this system consisting of the room, the rule book, and me and the Chinese figures knows Chinese. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing here that knows Chinese. And yet from the outside, it could look exactly like totally. a system that knows Chinese, mm -hmm. right? And this is a critique specifically of, most specifically of the Turing test. Mm -hmm. So, and the Turing test basically says, well, if you create a computer and you can have a conversation with it that is indistinguishable from a conversation you have with a normal person, then say that the computer is thinking, right? right? That's all it really takes, mm -hmm. right? So, Searle so says, well, look, you know, this system could pass the Turing test, but there would be no knowledge of Chinese going on. Right. So, therefore, the Turing test is not a test of real language understanding. It's not a test of real conscious knowledge of Chinese. Mm -hmm. Um, and he thinks basically all computer programs are like that. They're just kind of rules that get implemented by a machine, but there's no consciousness right. really going on. And, no so I th and I think one of the things that, so I want your take on this, is like the difference between almost like machine learning and deep learning. Because machine mm -hmm. learning, it's, it's like, you know, you put in certain inputs and then it learns, at, or sorry, you put in certain inputs and then it, you know, does the if-then statements. But mm -hmm. then deep learning is almost how we as children learn. Yeah. We take in all the, con the context and different things. But then you could even say that at the end of that, that humans are, programming whatever and pro plugging in their biases. But one thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, so going off of that from the basically AI uh, becoming like sentient or intelligent through, through those processes, um, humans are fundamentally thought of as quote, more than processes of information. What he is saying that like computers are. Like um, that my experience of the color red is different than your experience of the color red, et cetera, in terms of consciousness. So I, I just want to kind of piggyback off that and like what exactly is consciousness, you know? And I know that that's a big, yeah. big laudable thing, but like where do we start? You know, I, it's a very like re we can either be reductionist in the terms of like taking it as a biological process that all of a sudden we, it emerges that you and I are conscious or it can come and people have said like panpsychism is that like, you know, we are kind of tuned in to consciousness coming to us and that can be our soul. So where, like, where do you start even in the, in the thought experiment of the Chinese room? Where, where's the beginning or where's the a priori or where's, where's the start of kind of this conversation? 
Well, I think it helps to have a good definition of consciousness. That's a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I think it's actually really hard to come up with a good definition of consciousness, and I think there are for principal sure. reasons for this. Sure. So, you know, when we think about defining things, we often think about definition in terms of an analytic function, an analytic decomposition of its components. Right. Right? So if you think about how, what's a rectangle? Right. Well, a rectangle is a planar closed figure that's got four sides and right angles. Right, right. right. And that kind of breaks it down into some components, right? And that's a nice definition of a rectangle. <laughs> and then anytime you see a rectangle, then you should be, or you should be able to define that as such. Right. right. Yeah. So, but you, you, you probably can't define consciousness kind of in terms of an analytic decomposition in that way because consciousness, at least some people think, it's kind of a fundamentally simple phenomenon that's mm -hmm. not decomposable into these other phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, you also can't define it functionally. Like you could, you say a heart, well, that's just an organ that functions to pump the blood, mm -hmm. right? It's not clear what the function of consci consciousness would be. You can't really define it by synonymy because it raises the same questions. People will say, well, consciousness, I mean like the stream of experience, mm. or I mean, that there's something it's like to be you, right? So you could, or I mean, phenomenology, right? There are all these mm -hmm. terms mm -hmm. that people use that are more or less interchangeable, but you're kind of just swapping out interchangeable right. terms that all have the same kind of unclarity in them. So what is the zest then of consciousness? What is the <laughs> essence? Yeah, what is so the I think <laughs> the, I think the only way to define it is a way that seems kind of dis unrespectful, uh, 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 disrespectable, mm. which is, but I think is a, is a way that we often define things. And that's defining it by example. Mm. And I think if you look at the best relatively neutral definitions of consciousness in the philosophical literature, they are all at root definitions by example. Mm. So the way that people like Searle or Ned Block or I define consciousness is by pointing to examples of it and saying, well, it's stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Right, so if you close your eyes and you form a visual image of your house or your apartment, mm -hmm. Right? That's an example of a conscious experience. Mm. If you remember a time that you were like vividly angry about something, sure. right? That's an example of a conscious experience you had. Mm -hmm. If you think about feeling hungry, if you think about opening your eyes and looking at something and having a visual experience, right? If you imagine a tune running through your head, all these things are examples of consciousness. And really it's kind of the only way to define consciousness, I think, or the best way is to say, well, it's stuff like that. Yeah, stuff like that. Stuff like that, <laughs> right? And then you kind of have to hope that we agree. Okay, yeah, yeah we both glommed on to the same thing. Stuff yeah. like that, right? There's something obvious. I think there is an obvious property that all those things have in common that other stuff doesn't have. Doesn't have. Right, yeah. like a book doesn't have that going on right. in it, right? And, you know, the growth of your toenails doesn't have that kind of stuff mm -hmm. going on in it. Mm -hmm. um, and even some of your brain processes don't have that kind of thing going sure. on in it. So, um, so yeah, so I think we define consciousness by example, right? Like you define furniture. Yeah, exactly. Right? You define furniture. You know, no one has an analytic definition of furniture, right? You just right. say, well, here's an example, here's an example, here's an example, right? These other things don't count, right? You get it? Right, right, right. So I think the only way to define consciousness really is by, by example. example. So, okay, then let's take it a, a higher layer then. Yeah. Okay, so not individually. Do you think that there's a possibility of like, say a collective consciousness of sorts? Right. You know, like, um, it, you know, in, in, in integrated memory. Because there's been some seri theories about like our anthropomorph or our evolutionary past of that uh, every single primate is averse to snakes. Like yeah. seeing it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so that people say that's our evolution, et cetera, but it's almost right. like a collective unconscious mm. or something or a consciousness. So is there a way yeah. that maybe a society can come be conscious or right. or maybe a company or say an idea of itself? Because it seems like once an idea gets going, like inertia is a SOB, you know, like once it gets going, it's yeah. hard to stop it. And so can, can something become conscious, an idea of sorts? Yeah. So um, I've argued that if some of the mainstream theories of consciousness that you see in philosophy and psychology and neuroscience are true, mm -hmm. then, uh, and you apply them to the case of the United States, 
then the result would be that the United States is consciousness, mm. is conscious by those standards, right? Right, so, right, right. So here's the idea, right? Think about the United States. I, I like, I choose the United States because it's a, it's a, an example of a large entity with a lot of information exchange. Oh yeah, and it's been around for a little bit. It's, it's been around for a little bit. It's, it's, it's kind in of, a bunch of places. It's got <laughs> some unity to it, right? So I, I like the example of the United States. You could do it with some other things yeah, too, sure. though. But, but think about the United States as a spatially distributed entity mm -hmm. in which people are parts. Kind of like cells are part of your body, mm -hmm. right? So think of it as a spatially distributed entity like that, right? And then think, okay, there's a lot of information exchange among these people. This is an entity that has parts, lots of parts, yep. right? And if you take kind of standard theories of consciousness and you apply them to this entity, once you conceptualize the United States that way, it seems like the United States meets the criteria, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So there are a lot of theories of consciousness that trade on the idea that consciousness involves a certain kind of massive sharing of information Mm -hmm. in big recurrent loops, mm -hmm. maybe some kind of self-monitoring aspect of that too. Sure. Right? Oriented towards some sort of goal-directed action. Right. Well, the United States, this entity that I'm imagining now, the United States has massive information sharing, has massive self-representation, mm -hmm. has m organizes itself to do various things like invade Iraq and limit exports mm -hmm. and you know send someone to the moon and all kinds of things. So if you take these, a lot of these uh, standard theories of consciousness that you find in the literature and then apply them to that case, then it looks like those theories imply the United States is literally conscious. Right. Not metaphorically. Not, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, right, right, but right, right. It right, has right. an actual stream of experience over and above the experiences of its citizens. Wow. Now, what, can, what do you do with that? Yeah, you exactly. You say, well, those theories are right, and so, <laughs> hey, you know, Fantastic. the United States is conscious, and you might not have thought it, but science proves all kinds yeah. of exciting things. Oh, wait, yeah, <laughs> right? Way you know? crazy stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, you know, physics has some pretty totally. wild implications, you know, totally. so maybe consciousness science does too. You know, so that's one way you could go with it. Or another way you could go with it is to say, no, that's too absurd, right? There must be something wrong with these theories, mm -hmm. right? Another way you could go is say, no, look, you know, if you really look at the theory and you modify it appropriately to deal with this kind of case, then you'll find it doesn't really have that implication. Right. So there are a variety of ways you could go with that, um, but I don't. I wouldn't rule out the first reaction. Right. And and I think uh, one of the things that piggybacking off that, and we mentioned before, is um, I wrote a blog post about object-oriented ontology, triple O, and so it was made famous by Graham Harmon and the speculative realists of basically if you undermine something and break it down into its component parts. So if we give the example of the United States, you break it up into states, you break it up into citizens, you break it up into r infrastructure, etc., and then you uh, so if you undermine it that way, then you overmine it. What is its, you know, effects, if you will? Well, we've had a foreign policy, you know, doing X in the Middle East. Like we have certain viewpoints that have been doing, you know, whatever to Canada, Mexico. But then there is this this thing, this Heideggerian thing in itself that's just the third option, which is just the United States. Could that third table, if you will, in Heideggerian like talk of being something, a thing in itself, just be consciousness? And I don't, I'm mm. not trying to get too crazy or, or overlapped, right. but it's just an interesting thought experiment that it's like, it's, it's very similar. It, it kind of plays in the, it's, or at least to me, to, to a layman. So I don't right. know if you're, what's your thoughts on speculative realism, OOO, et cetera. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's hard to have a really, I think it's hard to justify a really confident opinion about the, these big picture metaphysical meta questions. Let's start with there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, yeah, we're 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 hypoth Yeah, we're riffing, people. We're riffing. Yeah, this is good. So, I, I mean, I'm inclined to think that there is an external world mm -hmm. that's independent of our minds. Yep. Right. Um, it has real properties that are independent of us. Um, it's got objects that exist independently of us and we have no like super privileged or special position within it. Right. Right. So that aspect of object oriented ontology seems to me pretty plausible. Yeah. Um, but I have to admit the other view does to me have a little bit of attraction. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I'm interested in doing as a metaphysician mm -hmm. is thinking about possibilities that I think are probably not true, 
Mm. But which I can't rule out. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, the way most people do metaphysics, the way it's usually done, is someone comes and says, okay, here's, here's what I think is right. Here's yeah. the truth, right? Yeah. And they give you the truth. And I kind of like almost never, basically never, find those arguments <laughs> like fully convincing, right? Right. But There's always a something in there that just kind of doesn't like, sit right. How do you know yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you know that? Yeah. Um, so I think another way of thinking about metaphysics is to think about not what is the truth, but what are some possible truths that are different from what I assume to, you, uh, to be the case. Mm -hmm. so and those may not necessarily be true in themselves. You are right. just trying to mess with it almost, like trying to get to that better viewpoint of how true something is. is. It, right. it just seems like you're, you're almost taking the scientific method approach in that, yeah, I have some great knowledge, I have some great intuitions, but there's always the chance that new information can come and then mess this entire thing up. Right, you yeah, know? for sure, right. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I think in metaphysics we have pretty, you know, it's hard to know the kinds of questions that people dispute. It's hard to know the answers to those questions. Um, so yeah, as someone who's kind of skeptical about that, I, there's this different kind of enterprise you can engage in, which is um, discovering possibilities you might not have thought of before. Totally. Even if you think they're probably not true. So I'll give you just one example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is a, a paper I recently published called Kant Meets Cyberpunk. Okay, interesting. Right, so I love that name. <laughs> you describe object-oriented ontology. I think it's kind of opposed to a Kantian perspective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so, and you know, ultimately, I think I probably favor something more in that direction. But mm -hmm. uh, there's this, but maybe not. So, okay, so we were talking about computation mm -hmm. before, right? One of the interesting things about the, you know, about the theory of computation um, if you go back to Turing's theory, which is basically standard, mm -hmm. uh, is that it does not require spatiality. Mm. It doesn't require that the computational transformations take place in space. It probably requires temporality, right, in the sense, in order to have computation, you need to have state transitions from one, one state to another state. Oh, sure, right? yes, yes, phase, yes, yes, yes. So, um, so, let's see, how do I, what's the best way to enter this? Okay, so have you, uh, do you know about the simulation hypothesis? Of course, yes, of course. Right. Of course, so who doesn't? Nick Bostrom, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. Nick Bostrom. So this is the idea that we, we might be living inside of a computer. Yeah. Right, so the idea is, well, look, you know, if you set aside Surly and wor worries, mm -hmm. John mm -hmm. Searle's worries, right, and other kinds of worries, you know, maybe, Computers could be conscious, and mm -hmm. if computers could be conscious, then maybe some of their subparts could be conscious, and we could be those subparts, mm -hmm. you know, living inside of computers with almost like, you know, in the program The Sims, mm -hmm. right? Those little AI programs, we could be like them, mm -hmm. right, in these artificial environments. Well, anyway, ho hopefully your viewers know a little bit about. Yeah, that. yeah, they they get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simulation right. theory. Yeah, right. right. So yeah. we could be artificial intelligences living inside of computers. I do not think this is likely. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know that we can totally rule it out. Right. All right. Next step is computers don't have to be material. Mm. Right? Interesting. It's not part of the theory of computation that computers are material. Mm -hmm. Right? In fact, Hilary Putnam, the uh, famous philosopher, says, look, you could make a computer out of ectoplasm, soul stuff. Right, right. right? You can make a computer out of an immaterial soul, a Cartesian angel. Yes, 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 right? okay. So what if we are entities instantiated in a computer program and the fundamental underlying layer of the computer program is immaterial? Mm. It's a, a Cartesian angel or something like that. Right. Right. Then spatiality would not be a fundamental part of the universe. All of the things we see around us in the kind of empirically given world mm -hmm. would be things that are effects of the way the computer is structured. Right. And the computer is structured very differently at a fundamental level. So right. spatiality in the empirical world would be something about how we, something about us, something about how we experience Mm. This reality that at the fundamental level is radically different from right. our experience of it. And that fundamental reality might be 
unknowable to us because we're st all of our empirical science is is within this spatiality that arises as a uh, as a result of something radically different underneath. Right. So, and that's getting in the direction. It's not full blown Kant. No, no, but that's but that's but it's getting in the direction. Oh, totally. Of Kant, right. So you've got this kind of um, this phenomenal world of spatial spatiality and appearances. Science is completely constrained to that world, but behind it there's some noumenal uh, uh, way of things that is radically different and unknowable to us. Yeah. Right? So, you know, so I think thinking about that weird possibility, which yes. I think is very unlikely to be true, right? But thinking about that weird possibility and thinking, well, you know, I can't totally rule that out, I think opens us up, or at least it opens me up, to, to a Kantian perspective in general. Totally. Right? Like, okay, I'm inclined toward an object-oriented ontology in which, you know, there really is material stuff independent of us, right? right? But, like, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe Kant is right. Maybe, maybe there's some kind of, it's all kind of a phenomenal world that doesn't really track on to very well what's going on underneath. Right. And we're all kind of, we're kind of in this bubble of, appearances.